and uh, <coughs> okay, so this is the title. It's uh, the dynamics of vortex filaments in corners, and let me start with the with the, the abstract. In the abstract, I, I, I wrote that I was going to speak out some uh, geometric flow of a curve in R3, which is the so-called binormal flow. So the, the curve moves with the speed of uh, the curvature and the direction of the binormal. And then first I will consider, and I'm interested in corners. Then the first part of the talk will be uh, to consider the case where you have just one corner and otherwise it is regular, the curve. And then I, the second part of the talk will be in the particular case that you consider a regular polygon, say a lateral triangle or, or a square. The first part was uh, some long time collaboration with Valeria Banica and the, and the second half is uh, something we started some time ago but the paper appeared one year ago with uh, Francisco de Lao. Okay, the, oh sorry, for some reason this is working the other way around. And of course there is uh, a question, if I have a corner and uh, the velocity is given in direction of the binormal, is what is the velocity at the corner, right? Does it make any sense? All right, so, uh, well, in the title also appears vortex filaments, and the really the thing we would like to do is to understand the picture <coughs> we see in front of you. This is uh, the typical smoke ring, and, uh, well, uh, what do you see? I don't know. I, I would like to see. <laughs> I, so I, could, I can't tell you what I would like to see. <laughs> okay? I would like to see some filaments, not just uh, some fat cube. You can imagine that you have um, some, uh, say, thick this fat cube and you have some kind of, of filament, right? And, uh, well, that's what I would like to see. Then I would like uh, also to stress, uh, like, uh, several properties that I see in this picture. First of all, is the self-similarity. You have kind of the same picture at different scales, right? And if I have to describe this uh, geometrically, I would say that you have some kind of a circle here, some kind of uh, an helix going up, and it is unclear in the picture how are these helixes, how they are winding around what. But in any case, you have circles, helixes, and uh, self-similarity, and some current effects, of course. All right, so this is the first picture. Uh, I'm sorry. Let's get the disk in the other way. Okay. And this is the second picture, which is the vortices above an inclined triangular wing. Again, you have some self-similarity. Maybe now you can even imagine that you have some filament, right? You uh, clearly have here the, the helices that they win around some two even lines. And well, it is not clear what happens at the other side because we don't see it, right? So we could imagine that there are some circles on the other side. Maybe we could. Uh, I'm sorry? See? Do you mean the curvature? Well, <laughs> I can read. I can write. I can read what you say, uh, which are lines of color fluid in a water show the symmetrical pair of vortices behind a thin wing of 15 degrees semi vertex, semi -vertex angle at 20 degrees angle of attack. Okay, so you have you have a, a, a wing, and then it is moving in some. And in fact, it's moving in water, right? And then you use some kind of dice, uh, dice water to see how the velocity. But honestly, uh, I have even uh, <laughs> another question, which is <laughs> going back to this. Uh, I don't think you use here any kind of dice, anything. So this happens like, uh, I mean, what I'm trying to, to explain is this jump happened naturally, which is not a question that I put dice and I don't put dice and then I put dice again. So these structures appear like natural. And honestly, I don't know what happened. <laughs> In this case, I would like to know. I guess it's uh, that they put dice at some point and then they don't put dice. So I don't know. Anyway, my question is: Can I say at least, uh, or, or can I try to convince you some candidate to be these curves that appear in R3? That is my question. <coughs> this is a picture in bachelor's book, for example, yeah, in the classical book in fluid dynamics. 
and it's u2 omega. Anyway, so let's uh, try to do some math. Then you start with Euler equations. You have a velocity field. And then you have the vorticity field, which is the curl of uh, the velocity field. And now uh, I guess that you I want to, to describe mathematically what I mean by a vortex filament. It is uh, a vector measure that it is singular, and the support of this singular vector measure is a curve in R3. Okay? So here, capital T is the tangent of the vector. Uh, the curve is given by capital X, so this is to be little s, so it's the derivative with respect to capital X, which is the tangent vector, and this is how you describe your singular measure in R3. So this is the current plane, the divergence has to be zero. And then the question is, if I give you what is the curl, then how do you compute the velocity, right? And this is the well-known Biot-Savart formula, which is that uh, you know the curl, and you know that the divergence is zero, then you compute the curl again, and then you obtain the minus Laplacian. So you compute the curl and you invert, and this is what you get, right? And this is the velocity at the point P, which is, uh, so let me try to at least make a picture now that you can see something. <coughs> so you have uh, your curve, and uh, this is capital X. You have a, a point here with the tangent vector. And of course, this integral makes plenty of sense as long as the P is outside of the curve. But what you would like to do is to compute the velocity precisely at the curve. And well, if you look a little bit to the integral, it looks really bad. Extremely singular. So then, what you could do, and this is what it was done <coughs> some time ago, is to, to do you, you consider your point P, there is a, the closest point to this point P, it's taken as some S naught, right? X, capital X of S naught. Then you do some Taylor expansion and see what happens. And then I don't, I don't want to go really into the details of this because uh, I don't think it goes too far. This is probably not the right way of understanding the, the limit at the given point. But anyway, the first, I tell you what happens. The first term is to change the, the curve by the straight line, and then the straight line is not going to move because the, the fluid is, it goes around. So then you have to go to the second term. But the second term has some logarithmic divergence, as you can easily see from the singularity of the kernel, and this divergence grows when you approach to the to the filler. And then what do you do? Well, you, you don't like this logarithmic divergence, so you kill it. Okay. I renormalize time, and that's it. Anyway, so what it is <coughs> relevant is that there is a second term that has some logarithmic growth, and you capture it, and the answer is very simple. <coughs> right? So you see, you do a Taylor, a Taylor expansion. So it's a, a, this is a non-local thing, so you eventually are going to finish with something which is completely local. <coughs> but uh, before telling you which is <laughs> the, the, uh, the model I am going to consider, the approximation, it is relevant to say that at the level of the uh, Euler equations, you can consider solutions which are straight lines where the fluid doesn't move. You can consider vortex, ring, vortex rings that move in the, uh, in, the, in the direction orthogonal to the plane that contains the ring and with a velocity which is proportional to the curvature. And also, in you have some, not helices, you have some helicoidal shapes that are also solutions of Euler equations. Anyway, now what I promise, if you do the Taylor expansion and you forget what you, uh, what the, the, the terms you don't like, what you get is a very simple, in principle, object, which is completely local, and it is the one you are seeing on the, on the slide. So capital X was the curve, remember, C is time, so the derivative with respect to time equals the derivative of X with respect to S cross product with the second derivative. And if you do, uh, I will write in a minute uh, the uh, Fresnel system, this is very uh, easy to see that in geometric terms, the velocity is the curvature times the binary. Okay? So in particular, <coughs> If I start with a circle, I will obtain a circle that is moving in the, in, the in the direction perpendicular to the plane that contains the circle. But of course, there is some orientation. I have to decide some orientation, and this determines if the binormal goes up or down, okay? Which in the previous uh, slide was the gamma. I didn't talk about the gamma was the constant, which is... 
In principle, no. No. And, in, and this is related to the, the Helmholtz theorem about that the circulation on a, uh, on a vortex cube has to be a constant. Okay. All right. <coughs> anyway. So, remark? Yes. In the world. So this is something that usually happens. You will see it in a minute. Uh, I, wa I was planning to use a little bit of blackboard, but I think it's probably worth it. Okay. So <coughs> uh, we w it's very easy to see that, in fact, the length of the tangent vector remains a constant along the evolution. So you can really parameterize uh, using arc length from the very beginning. Of course, people w working in fluid dynamics, they don't like this, because they, they claim that uh, then the, the, the cube has not a but uh, there is a confusion, a big confusion what, uh, between what it is a, a vortex cube and what it is a vortex filament. And because you have to pass to the limit and this limit is completely unclear, well, then anyway, this is what happens. Okay? The arc length is, is preserved, which is a very strong uh, All right? <coughs> so this is... Um, rather simple and now because uh, I was trying to convince you that uh, I want to describe the pictures I showed you then I had to ask for such similar solutions here it's rather simple you, you pick up uh, there are more than one scaling it's very much like in Euler but there is only one that preserves the arc length and it is the one you see so then uh, instead of working with capital X <coughs> you work with the derivative of capital X which is capital T and it is in here where you see immediately that the length of the tangent vector is zero Right, because if I do the inner product of T with TP, I obtain T. Okay? And of course, uh, this is nothing but the Schrodinger map in 1D, and when the target is the, the sphere. Because this is the covariant derivative of the derivative of capital T multiplied by the little i on the sphere. Okay? <coughs> and of course, instead of working with at this level, instead of working with the sphere, I could work, for example, with the hyperbolic sphere. Okay. That uh, will appear in later on, but I'm not so much interested in this today. Okay? All right. So now I was trying to tell you which are the similar solutions. We know what we have to do. We fix the distances for the capital T. I'm using, I'm calling capital T two different things. So if I differentiate with respect to <coughs> T and uh, with respect to S, and I make T equals one, you immediately obtain that, uh, for example, the differentiation with respect to t will give you the minus one half that appears here, and this remains the same. So this is now uh, an ODE system, <coughs> and you look for solutions. Um, because you are dealing with geometric term, uh, with geometric um, objects, you can now use uh, the Frenet equations and write the system using the geometric quantities. So then <coughs> the left-hand side now becomes minus h over 2 and t prime, but t prime is the curvature times the normal. So this is the curvature, this is the normal, the tangent, the torsion, and the binormal. Okay? So the left-hand side is this, and the right-hand side is t, uh, cross product with the, the first derivative of ts. So you have to differentiate this. This is the derivative of the t, t prime, and now m prime is this equation here. So you put everything together, and now you make the observation that on the right you only have the normal, right? While on the right you have a term which is the binormal, which is this one. So immediately you obtain that the, the derivative has to be zero, so that means of the curvature, so that means that the curvature has to be a constant, and the torsion has to be s over 2, and of course this was done a long time ago, in particular by Batke, who was a student of Chorin in his thesis, but in fact this appeared much later, much before, in the early 80s, uh, done by the people looking at the landau lipschitz model of the Schrodinger map. All right, so now <coughs> you could wonder how is this uh, curve, right? So I'm describing the capital G by these geometric properties. So let's think a little bit. So close to the origin, S is zero. So that means essentially that you have a, a curve with a, a curvature, a constant curvature. So that will be essentially a circle, right? Now, if you fix, say, S of size capital N, now what you have is something which is a fixed a curvature constant and curvature torsion is also a constant, so this will be an helix that uh, the pitch of the helix will increase with the, the distance to the origin. 
And the only thing that remains to know is where do these lines, what are the asymptotics of this, of this curve? Anyway, so this is the picture. <coughs> so in here, what you see, this could be the G, right? And this is uh, what I was telling you. This is the, the circle of a circle. Now you start to see the ellipses down here. And well, uh, now what you have to prove, but of course it's not very difficult, is that uh, this, uh, uh, the asymptotics of the curve is this line when it goes to plus infinity and this line when it goes to negative infinity. And the only thing that you see here is just uh, the, the, <coughs> the self similarity I was mentioning before. So I construct G <coughs> and then I do this, right? So then uh, if I want to study what is the initial condition, what I have to study is, or what I have to answer is the question of what is the limit when T goes to zero plus of uh, this expression, right? Okay. But uh, that is the same because uh, this goes linear. This is linear at infinity. So this cancels this. So the only thing I need to know is what is the value of G, what is the straight line at plus infinity and negative infinity. So at time zero, what you recover is the corner, I promise you, one corner. Okay? And you see it in the picture, right? So this is what happens at T equals to zero. And you can go forward in time or backward in time. All right? This is because uh, really it is uh, the only the only change you have to do is to change in order to change t into minus t is to change s into minus s. So it's to change the orientation of the curve. All right. So this can tell you. So now I can even tell you a, a, a candidate to the uh, to the question I posed at the beginning. What is the velocity of the corner? Here it is. Here it is. This is the corner, and it clearly there is a notion of what is the velocity. Of the of the corner, it is the one dictated by the self-similar solution. Of course, it is not so simple because remember that uh, uh, what we knew was the the constant of the curvature, meaning I know that say uh, here this is a circle of radius one over eight, right? But uh, then uh, the initial condition is given by this angle, theta. So what is the connection between theta and a? And, and this is a scattering problem because the connection we have seen is the asymptotics at plus infinity or minus infinity. Right? So the information is at the origin, but in order to make the connection between the constant that gives you the curvature with the angle, you have to understand the evolution at plus minus infinity. And this will play a role in the terms I will explain later on. But really, the velocity of the binormal at the, at, the at the vertex is given by this other angle that is also a non-local thing because it is determined by the values of plus minus infinity. All right? So at least there is a candidate for the notion of having defining the velocity as a curve. All right, so now the comparison with the, say that again. Ah, the Schrodinger map is a constant. So the Schrodinger map is at time zero is this vector, and uh, at time at th for s negative is this vector, and for s positive is this vector. So it's piecewise constant. So it's this. Sorry, and for t positive it is the Cornu spiral. So you go to the sphere and you have these two vectors. This is the sphere, and then you define the Cornu spiral. The Cornu spiral was something studied by by Euler, in fact. It is the spiral that has uh, the curvature is the is uh, proportional to arc length. In the plane, this is nothing but uh, in the plane. If you ask what is the Cornu spiral in the plane, is the solution of this problem for the free Schrodinger equation. So the solution for the Cornu spiral in the sphere is the solution of the same, where this is this vector and this is this vector, but on the sphere. So this is what you see all the time. You see. Because uh, remember, uh, it is Ts over square root of T. So you don't, if you look at it geometrically, the only thing you see is at, at time zero, these two points, and at time positive, this curve. This is what you see. 
And of course, uh, this is at the qualitative level, it's, well, it's more or less okay. I would like to give you something more quantitative, but of course I don't know how to do this. Or at least not yet. So <coughs> now, uh, the connection with the Schrodinger equation, I guess we all know that uh, the Schrodinger map, you can use some kind of transformation that in this case is called the Hashimoto transformation, which is uh, if you give me the, <coughs> the curvature and distortion, you construct uh, this uh, complex uh, function, uh, which is has a modulus is the curvature and the derivative of the phase is the distortion. And then <coughs> you ask what is the equation for this uh, complex function if T and tau, the curvature and the torsion, are the curvature and the torsion of the capital X, which is a solution of the binormal flow. And this is a <coughs> computation that done by Hashimoto in 71. <coughs> that in a sense uh, trivializes the problem because uh, cubic NLS is something that we all understand pretty well, okay? So you can say, well, cubic NLS, 1B, that's it, all right? <coughs> and this is, uh, in fact, it's uh, very much like this, but not, uh, not completely. Why? Because uh, look at what is the, 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 the example I am interested in. The example I was interested in was the curvature is a constant that when I do the the similarity is the, the constant A divided by the square root of T. And the psi is essentially, uh, uh, this is just, just E to the S square over T. So the modulus is going to be a constant, right? So this is what I was saying. In our case, the particular solution is this one, which is nothing but the fundamental solution of the free Schrodinger equation. So if I compute the L2 norm, then I obtain plus infinity. And now, of course, there are two possible uh, observations. Well, is well, then this has infinite energy, so it is not uh, relevant. Okay? Yes? A is the curvature. Remember that the G was characterized. This is our free parameter. So G was characterized by the property that the curvature is A and the torsion is S over T. Ah, I'm sorry, capital A. Yeah, this is the, the, the freedom of gauge you have. You are going from capital X to psi, and this plays a role. Okay? It's good to, well, it, it plays a role. I mean, you have to keep track of it. Of course, it's always real. Huh? So if it is real, then of course you can put this term with the little i and this one, and you change in the gauge, you absorb it, and there is no problem. But for example, if you want to make sense of uh, this solution for the nonlinear problem, well, unless you put some A of T, then it is not a solution. Okay? But if you choose A of T properly, which of course the choice is, <coughs> and this will appear later, is minus A squared over T, well, then you can say that you have a solution of the delta function as an initial condition. Okay? This is important. So this was the curve. So the, delta, the initial condition for the cubic NLS is the delta function. And the little a is the, the, the weight. It is not the curvature. It is not the curvature of the corner. It is not true that uh, if I give you this plane curve and I tell you now compute, compute the, the curvature of this corner, is little a. That is not true. It is a different one. OK? <coughs> Good, so now we have a particular solution, which is, but then uh, I was saying, well, you have infinity, and this is then uh, have uh, en infinite energy, but this is not completely true, because really, if I look, it is, uh, the energy is locally integral. For example, imagine that you consider an helix. An helix also has this property, but the only difference is that it is periodic, and then you say that this in L2 as a periodic function. Here, what happens is they are considering helixes of different pitches. So the energy is uh, locally defined, and at least it's locally in L2, our particular case. Okay, so now I have to explain what is this picture. Because uh, uh, I, I will state the theorem, and in order to understand the theorem of the theorem, we have to understand this picture. All right, what is this picture? <coughs> this picture is the, so look, there are two parts. One is the, this one, and, and the other one, the thing that is to say, above the, the plane z equals zero. So what you see above the plane z equals zero is precisely the, the previous uh, pictures where I, 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 I put the self-similar solutions at different times. 
remember? So I started with this, this was the E, and then I moved for time from one state to zero, and I obtained the corner there. Right? <coughs> now what is the, the other part of the picture? Well, it is clear. Remember that uh, the equation is, is, uh, uh, is uh, time reversible. In order to change t into minus t, the only thing I have to do is to change s into minus s. That means that I have to uh, 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 change the uh, orientation of the curve. Right? So if I start with this orientation, and I say I'm going forward in time, in order to go backward in time, the only thing I have to do is to change the orientation. So how can I do that? I just do a rotation, and that's it. Okay? And rotations, of course, leave invariant the set of solutions. So the second part of the picture is to do that for you, which means that I have changed the orientation of the uh, the corner, say the initial corner, at the initial curve at time one, at time zero, and then instead of going forward, I'm going backward. And it is clear by doing this, I obtain a solution for a strictly positive time a solution for a strictly negative time that at time zero has the same curve. Now, of course, the question is, is this a solution? Because the only thing I have done is to put the two things together. Okay? And also, notice that if it is true that this is a solution, I start with something which is really nice, which is, say, the, the, the function g after a rotation. I generate a corner, right? There is some kink in the binormal, but I, I come back to a nice curve. So I have a nice curve, I create a corner, and then I am back to a, a nice curve. All right? And <coughs> of course, this is something, uh, this picture is done uh, just by the way I was telling you. I did uh, for the t positive, which is to put, to plot the g and to do. I, this is not numerical, that's what I'm trying to say. This is completely artificial. I did. Then, of course, I would like to see if this is uh, not, uh, not only if it is a solution, but if I make some perturbation, if it, I still have a solution, because otherwise it is completely useless. All right, and this is the theorem. <coughs> the theorem is that the self-similar solutions understood in this way, I mean, this picture, is a straight line. Okay? So that means that if I start with this guy and I make a small perturbation, Right? I am close all the time to the picture you see. In fact, I uh, still have a corner at time zero, which is the one exactly the same as the one of the self-similar solution I am close to. So it's extremely rich. So that's the reason why I only put this picture. Because uh, the theorem is saying that if I make a small perturbation at time negative one, essentially I see the same. And you see, this is fixed at plus minus infinity. Of course, if I make a perturbation at, uh, say, time negative one, I will change this line and this line. But once this is done, these lines remain fixed. All right? But the corner, it will be the one of the self-similar solution. It will not be this angle. It will be the one of the self-similar solution. All right? And of course, in particular, the creation and relation of a corner is a stable procedure. This is one of the questions. All right, so I'm not going to give a precise statement because I will need, a, well, really the, the rest of the talk. And I'm not going to give a proof because this is some, something has taken some, taken us some time, okay? So let me give you just some hints of, uh, it's going to be just this slide. So this is a theorem that uh, I proved with Valeria Banica along several years, <coughs> and in, uh, at some point it uses in a very strong way the characterization of the self-similar solution. So, uh, meaning that even an A, there is a unique angle such that this A comes from this angle. So, given this A, there is a unique theta such that this theta comes from this A. Okay, <coughs> and given any theta, the same. All right, and this was done uh, uh, some time ago with Susana Gutierrez and Judith Rivas. So let me tell you a few words about the proof. The first thing, as uh, we saw this morning, is you have a particular solution, then you have to find the right coordinates and the right energy. And because you are dealing with self-similar solutions, then you look for uh, self-similar variables that in this setting are called conformal, the conformal transformation. All right? Then the conformal transformation changes ST, of 
course, introduces some phase and some amplitude, blah, 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 but the, the unknown variables become S over T, 1 over T, probably with a, some force on the left. So that means that if time goes from 0 to 1 here, in here goes from 1 to infinity. Or if in the one goes from 1 to 0, the other one goes from 1 to infinity, right? So now the initial value problem here becomes the behavior at time infinity. So then it is a scattering problem. So really to solve the initial value problem was to solve the wave operator and the asymptotic uh, completeness of the wave operator. All right, so then uh, in order to do that, because this is long range, you have to find not only the, the right phase, which in, in this case was very easy, but also the right spaces, because in fact there are some problems. In the new variable, for example, if I look at uh, the new, have these variables, I have a new unknown, and I look for the equation in the new unknown. For example, the zero Fourier mode blows up, generically, okay? So then you have to figure out some function space that uh, sees this change. All right, so <coughs> as a conclusion, really, of this long range uh, uh, potential, if you look at the initial value problem of the cubic, this is an important fact, okay? It has to be clear. So you could say, well, in one way or another one, the only thing you are doing is to solve the cubic NLS with delta function as initial function. Okay, what Valeria and I prove is that that is ill posed. It's generically ill posed as an initial value problem. So that means that this picture we saw that you can create a corner, so you start a negative one, you create a corner, and you go forward in time, that it is true because that's what we are saying for the, the Schrodinger map, for the capital T, and for the binormal flow, for the capital S, is false for the cubic NLS. You cannot do it, period. It is ill posed. So you cannot work with cubic NLS and delta functions as an initial value. Well, then, what do you do? Because uh, you have to kind of recover the initial condition at time zero for the capital T and the capital X. And how do you do it? Of course, you, you use some kind of blow-up procedure to capture <coughs> the self-similar solution. And once you have the self-similar solution, if you have a good characterization of the self-similar solution, that tells you which are your initial conditions at time zero. All right? And that's the reason why to have a complete characterization of the similar solutions is extremely rare. In this case, the similar solution does not appear as a, as a variational argument. Like that. So it's a different kind of argument. So this is more or less what uh, we did. So now, and this is the first half. Yes? Yes, you know. It's a similar reading. It's a because you remain close all the time to your similar solution, and really what you are doing is just doing a, a similar small solution. The only thing that happens at, at time zero is that some log, there is some interaction between the, the particular solution and the perturbation, such that the, 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 the perturbation eventually has some modification of the phase that does not allow you to speak about the, the initial value for the for the solution of the same way. But the time is fixed by the similar solution. Yes. Everything comes from the same. And of course, this is related to the energy of the similar solution, which is a constant. I mean, you remain close to that time. And this is related to the fact that you have your state lines fixed all the time. Okay? Okay, now a regular call. So I was telling you that you cannot deal with the uh, cubic NLS and, and corners, and I'm going to start precisely with the cubic NLS when I want to consider the polygons, the regular polygons. Okay? So now I, and the only thing I want to do is to look for a, a particular solution. So my question is, if I start, say, with... Um, oh, this, okay. <coughs> if I start with a square or a triangle, a equilateral triangle, can I tell you, can I construct one solution? Forget about uh, uniqueness or what? Before, what I used was the self-similarity with respect to scaling. And of course, if I, now I am in the periodic setting, so I, I cannot use the scaling, but I still, I can use some other symmetry. First of all, I write uh, the, the regular polygon 
in terms of the curvature, which is this guy here, right? And then capital M is the number of sides. Right? Good. Well, which are the other symmetries I'm going to use? The Galilean transformations, which are as follows. So this is, uh, uh, you give me, uh, is, it works as follows. You give me K and T, T is time, K is a real number. You give me a solution of, say, cubic NLS, and then I construct a new solution by using this recipe. So essentially, you see time is fixed. This is the typical Galilean <coughs> transformation, and in, or in, uh, <coughs> in order to, uh, to, to move with a different reference, uh, system of reference, then I have to change the phase. And this is the right phase. Okay, so if psi is a solution, this is also a solution of the cubic NLS. We all know that. But of course, what happens is that if I start with uh, a, a periodic, uh, a, 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 a bunch of periodic deltas, then uh, uh, if I take the k not to be any real number, but to be, in this case, I'm calling it j, I'm sorry, to, to take it just an integer number, then this is true, right? At the initial level, at the initial time, the self-similar solutions don't see the initial, the initial data. So this is true. So imagine that they have uniqueness. Of course, I have no idea if uniqueness is going to be true. But uh, the only thing I'm trying to do is to look for a particular solution. So let's assume that you have uniqueness. Then you conclude that your psi has to have this property. And this has to happen for all the integers. And of course, this is extremely strong. Because it is telling you the following. Let's uh, try to understand this extremely strong rigidity property using the Fourier coefficient. I define the Fourier coefficient of your function psi in this way. M, remember, was the number of psi. But now I know that I can write psi in a different way, which is this way. Okay? Then I manipulate, <coughs> right? I take this guy outside. I do some change of variable, and the final outcome <coughs> is this one, where now I have some new phase, which is all this guy you see in here, times this integral, but this is nothing but the Fourier coefficient of the psi, but not at j, but at j minus k. So the final <coughs> equation is this one, that the Fourier coefficient, the j Fourier coefficient, is written in terms of the j minus k Fourier coefficient. So the game is clear. I make, given j, I take k to be j, and then I know which are the Fourier coefficients. Of course, this is true also for the free Schrodinger equation. And what I am saying is how you construct the solution of the periodic free Schrodinger, I mean the Schrodinger equation constant coefficient with periodic boundary conditions. Well, you could do it this way. Only the, the only problem is that you don't know what is this guy, which is a function that depends just on time. In the case of the constant coefficient, you plug it into the equation and you conclude that this constant has to be, I mean this function that depends on time has to be a constant. That's it. But in here is a different issue. I don't know what is this. All right, so <coughs> now let's try to understand, although I don't know what is this value, let's try to understand what is the solution in geometric terms. And in order to do that, I am going to consider rational time. So now t is going to be a rational time. Well, not completely. It's going to be 2 pi over m squared times a rational, t over t. Right? And of course, this guy, I don't know what it is. But let's manipulate this trigonometric expression. Well, I cancel the, the ends and all that, and this is the trigonometric series. And of course, you know what to do. Now, the k, instead of writing in this way, I, I write it as qk plus l. So k becomes qk plus l. And now, instead of having one sum, I have two sums. One goes from negative infinity to positive infinity, and the other one goes from 0 to q minus 1. But of course, it's clear what happens, right? Because you are working in the ring cq, you are not, are, are not going to see this guy. So this is the final conclusion. <coughs> right? So at the beginning, if this was zero, time zero, I have delta functions and I have here mk. At rational time, instead of having m psi, I have mq psi. Right? And because this is, this is, these are the delta functions, right? And now it's mq, not m. So I started with m size, now I have mq size. 
And what is the, what are the curvatures? Well, the curvatures are now given by this trigonometric sum, which is extremely well known, as we will see in a moment. And of course, there is no reason to think that this is going to be a real number. In fact, it is not. Sometimes it's even zero, sometimes, but just very few times it's a real number. In general, it's a complex number. So now I have to understand what is this guy from a geometric point of view. Remember that psi was curvature and torsion. Right? So these are the delta functions multiplied by this guy. So which is the curve such that the corresponding psi has this property? So I have m q psi multiplied by a number which has curvature and torsion. What is this? Well, a little bit of thinking tells you that the only possibility is that this is a skew polygon. It is not going to be a planar polygon. Right? In order to have a planar polygon, the function multiplying the, the, the delta function should be a real function, and this is not. Okay? And also notice that I started, I started with some scale, capital M. And now I have another scale, which is capital MQ. And in terms of the, the, the trigonometric series, it is exactly the same. This trigonometric series is exactly the same as this one. But of course, what happens is that it is not a summable in trigonometric series. So, so how you sum the series is fundamental. But if you look at the, at the Fourier mode, well, you don't change the size of the Fourier mode, but you start with one scale and you end, with, end up with another. Anyway, so <coughs> all right. So this was uh, the sum I was saying before, which are the, the so-called uh, Gauss sums, and these are very well un understood. In fact, this is due to Gauss. And for example, if uh <coughs> this thing happens, that q div uh, divided by 2 is uh, uh, not uh, congruent, uh, but q is even and this thing happens, then in fact the sum is 0. Now if q is even and uh, this thing does not happen, not happen this one, then in fact it is a square root of times q and there is some phase. And if q is odd, it's a square root of q times this thing. These are pretty well. Of course, observe that for me the phase is completely fundamental. Because the phase is going to tell me how far I am from a plane. Right? So this is telling me essentially that the angle between two sides is going to be the same. Given Q is, all, is going to be the same. But how is the polygon depends completely on these phases. And these phases are pretty well known and well it's essentially although they are deterministic in fact, they are probably the, the very first example of uh, how to generate pseudo-random numbers. Okay? Anyway, <coughs> so this is what I was just saying. <coughs> and now if I put everything together, this is my psi. So now I have the bunch of delta functions with MQ size, and these are the guys. And uh, the modulus is the one I was telling you. Okay? So the angle between two sides of the polygon is going to be fixed and just depends on Q. Okay, so this is what I was saying. Rho is the angle, <coughs> and uh, theta m determines the point. Okay, and this is how everything depends on the alpha, the alpha m's and beta m's. How do depend on terms of rho and theta. M. All right, but we haven't computed yet this function that depends on time. Remember, the zero Fourier coefficient that can depend on time. We didn't fix it. So now we have to fix it. First, we have to integrate the Frenet frame. I am telling you <coughs> which is alpha and beta, so this is the equation I have to solve. Remember that, you ha that, remember that these are deltas, and the t's are polygons. The, so the, 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 the t's are the tangent vectors of a polygon, so these are going to be heavy side functions. The delta times a heavy side function, well, you have to do it with some curve. But of course, these are just, uh, this is very simple in this case because. If I want to construct the polygon, I say I am here, and the only thing I have to go from here to here. And of course, this lives in a plane. The plane will change with uh, the corner. But once I am here, I put myself in the given plane, and then the only thing I have to integrate is a plane curve with a, co with a, a corner, right? All right, that's a <coughs> but of course you have to fix from the beginning your frame. So you cannot do it all the time in, in, in a given plane. The plane is going to change. Anyway, so you do this, and this, this is the recipe. Given the, <coughs> the anti-symmetric matrix, the only thing you have to construct is the corresponding rotation matrix. And to go 
from this vector to this one is to, to do the corresponding rotation. And this is the way you construct the polygon. All right? So this is the way you solve the problem of multiplying the delta function by a polygon. All right. <coughs> so now the I still haven't tell you what is the way of computing the, the function of sigma that we don't know what it is. Well, what I what is going to be the condition? Very easy. I want the the polygon to be a closed polygon. All right. So then I <coughs> I compute all all my sides by doing all the multiplications of the corresponding rotation matrices. I'm sorry. I'm also calling it capital M. This was the number of sides. And of course, when I m made all the multiplications, I have to go back to the same uh, starting vector. So this has to be the identity. But remember that we have uh, uh, some symmetry because we started with a regular polygon with M sides. So instead of multiplying the MQ matrices, I multiply just Q of them. What I have to compute, and again, this is another M. This is a matrix, capital M. Sorry for the notation. Has to be the has to have the property that this matrix has to be an nth root of the identity matrix. Sorry, <laughs> so clear. <laughs> but uh, this uh, these are supposed to be bold forms, okay? And you see, this is uh, this is not there. Okay. So then, uh, how do you do that? Well, you assume that the trace of M has to be this, or that the eigenvalues are this, and the the final conclusion is that this is uh, the angle. We don't know how to prove this. In fact, this is the conjecture. This is the conjecture that the row that was the thing we were missing is given by this. This must be true, but let's move forward. So then I have everything, right? Because this was the thing I was missing. So now let's see what happens. <coughs> so now I have told you that if everything goes okay, in the sense that I have one so a solution which is unique, then that solution should be a polygon, if you give me a rational time, that should be a polygon with MQ sides. And I know which is the, precisely which is the polygon. Right? Okay. Then what I do is the following. I run, I use numerical analysis, I give the, with the precisely the Schrodinger map, so I solve Pt equals Ts, P over Ts cross Ts S. And then I give you the, the starting regular polygon to this guy. I do numerical analysis and I compute at rational times. And this is what you see on the left. Because you see, this is the, the typical Gibbs phenomenon. And this is the precise polygon we know how to compute because I know I have the rules. And amazingly, they are the same. Is it clear what I'm saying? So this is done by the machine. And this is our guess. Okay? And well, this is of course for some particular case. It's the triangle and for a given time. <laughs> amazingly, honestly, I don't know how and I don't know why, but they fit. Right? Everything is extremely singular. I am saying that the thing changes from rational to rational. How is it possible that the machine captures this? I have no idea. I have no idea. Anyway, but this is what. Okay, so now I need to say some uh, <coughs> some people. This is uh, this type of picture. I'm sorry. You see, this type of picture is what is called the Talbot effect in optics. And, uh, and this is a pure linear phenomena, uh, the Talbot effect. And uh, the connection with the free Schrodinger equation was done by Berry and Goldberg in the 88. Then uh, in a minute will appear uh, some other uh, picture, which is related to some, uh, something called the Riemann's no differentiable function. And the fractality of that was conjectured by Bresterman in 84 and was proved, in fact, it was proved that it was a multifractal by, by Jaffar. And now the Talbot effect in nonlinear problems was uh, first uh, suggested by Olber, although, well, anyway, by Olber, and uh, I think it's in KDB, but this again is mainly numerical. And essentially, one month before we put the, our paper in the archives, uh, Erdogan and Chirakis studied the Talbot effect for cubic NLS, but with a big difference. They consider for cubic NLS a, a discontinuous function. So I am considering a bunch of delta functions. So there is a gap of one derivative. So for them, the problem is 
subcritical. For me, it's critical so that they can use Duhamel's formula, and then what they prove is that the Duhamel term is regular, and everything comes from the non from the linear problem. And then the linear problem was studied first for Kolkov, and then for for Kapitalski and Rundi. So they prove theorems. We haven't. We are not able to prove theorems. Okay, but for a subcritical theorem. Okay. <coughs> Now, uh, the picture I promised you, what is this? <coughs> well, you can see that there is red and blue. Red is the, well, I hope you see it, but it is not a, co a complete clean red, okay? Yeah? And this is the trajectory, the trajectory of one corner. Okay, so, you give me this, this is the trajectory of this corner. And because you have this uh, rotation invariant, because this is the, the, uh, the square, then rotations act on the problem, so if you have uniqueness, this rotation has to be preserved. So that means that uh, this corner has to live in a plane, right? Because in this one, right? <coughs> the one which leaves this, this rotation in value. So then I can make the, if I uh, choose the right plane, this is, I can make the picture in one plane. So this is really the trajectory, you have to believe me, but this is a fact, it is the trajectory, say, that corner. And this is what you see. Red is, uh, the, I don't know, one is the, the, the numerics and the other one is the, the theoretical line. Okay? This is for m equals three. Now for m equals four, it's more or less the same, but it is not the same. And if you see this picture and have, uh, Listen, somebody is speaking about uh, Riemann's non-differentiable function. Then you immediately say, "Come on, this is uh, this has to have some connection with Riemann's non-differentiable function." And I will write in a minute. So this is Riemann's non-differentiable function. Let me write what is it. nothing but it starts with the same thing so it is the the Fourier multiplier of the uh, free Schrodinger equation and so you integrate it once but in time because in fact I am looking at the trajectory of the time and remember it was x of t equals which is essentially the psi this is essentially the psi so I have to integrate in time so if I integrate in time I divide by k squared of course, I, I cannot prove k equals zero, and this is the Riemann's non-differentiable function because Riemann conjecture that it, it of course it is continuous and had had no derivative at any time. That was not true because, in fact, you remember at some point the Gauss sum is zero. So for those those points, for those times, the derivative is uh, the function is differential. Okay, so if you make the picture of this guy, which is the plane curve, right? So you take the real part, and this is this. And this is ours. But as you see, we have a bunch of them because it depends on, on capital M. And then what we prove numerically is that when M goes to infinity, this goes to this. So in particular, when M equals 10, there is essentially no difference between this guy and this guy. And um, Jafar for this has a theorem that says that this is a multifractor, which means that the, the possible range of, uh, of uh, the of singularities is a continuous one. So you have a continuous range of possible creation of singularities. And all of them are self-similar, with, but with a different uh, rate. Okay? Well, this is, for example, the tangent vector. This is the pictures that uh, you can do also at the, at the three case. And, uh, for example, what happens with, uh, you look at very uh, uh, rationals with a larger denominator, well, you see, it seems that you don't have so many sides, but uh, when you look at the tangent vector, it's a real one. And if you see here, for example, the North Pole is, uh, you have reached the North Pole. That means that you cannot use really the stereographic projection of the Schrodinger map. That is a pretty bad idea, and that stops us for many, many years. It is not a good idea numerically to do the Schrodinger map. Let me finish <coughs> with something. I 
I told you that at some given point, at some given time, the Gauss sum goes zero. In particular, half of the period, this happens. So that means that if I start with a square, I obtain a square. But this is not the same square because you are in half of the period. So what you see is the square in this position. And if you start with a, tri a equilateral triangle, then at one third of the period, this is what you get. Then in between, you have something with six sides. So, of course, the question that everybody asks you, well, come on, this is a completely uh, ideal model. It's um, completely crazy that you can imagine that it has anything to do with real fluid. Because even I haven't, I'm not able to prove that this is a, a solution. I haven't even constructed completely. I have hints that this is possible. In the but this is a very natural question, right? If I start with something like this, do I see this? And if I start with something like this, do I see this? So now it's a question how you generate these uh, vortex rings, these smoke rings. Of course, you can do it with your mouth and smoking and all that. But uh, if what I want to do is clear. I don't want a hole with the shape of a circle. What I want is a hole with the shape of a equilateral triangle. And my, <laughs> my mouth, I'm sorry, <laughs> it is not so easy to do, right? <laughs> or with a, the shape of a square. So, in any case, what you can do is to go to YouTube, for example, <laughs> and see how the people do this. <laughs> and these are the so-called domestic uh, smoke cannons, and they are very easy to construct. You only have the only thing you have to do is to take a, a card cardboard box, right? And then you make the hole, and you 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 buy these uh, machines that make a smo a smoke that they use for this rock uh, concert. Right? Then you make the hole, you put the smoke, and you just hit and see what happens. Okay? And the question, of course, if I, if I see something like this or something like this, because I'm not going to see anything which is rational, but maybe this happens at half of a period. I mean, why not? Right? Okay. So here I am. Now I have become a, an experimental <laughs> mathematician. And this is my co author, it's uh, Patsy. <coughs> and this is the box. And of course, uh, well, now this is the triangle, which of course it is not a triangle by no means. You cannot expect to have the corners because you have this is, this is real life. So you have viscosity. I mean, you have plenty of things, right? And but of course, I, I see there a triangle, and the triangle is in a very precise position. So the question is, which was the shape of the the initial hole? Okay, you don't you have to believe me, but really the hole was in the other position. Okay, but in any case, if you go to the next picture. Now it is up, then it is down again, and then it is up again. Okay? And of course, this is something that you don't see with your eye because it cannot happen. This is something that you have to make a video and go picture by picture. All right? Now uh, I would like to try to convince you that in between these two guys, I see something with six sides. But of course, uh, <laughs> it depends a lot on how much imagination you have. And well, you can filter out a little bit, and, but that, of course, I'm not going to try to convince you of anything at all. But once you, you, you do this at home, well, you say, come on, this uh, must be somewhere, right? <coughs> and then, of course, you go to, to Google, and the keywords are, where is my here? The keywords are non-circular jet. So they are jets with a nozzle with the shape of a triangle, a lateral triangle, or a square. And this was, and this phenomena is, uh, is known, and it's called the uh, axis switching. And there was plenty of literature in the mid-80s, and from the mid-80s to the, the late 90s. And if you look at this literature, it's a little bit discouraging. Because uh, one, at least me, I have the feeling that if there are these people working in fluid dynamics, they do their stuff. Of course, they know what they are doing. And they describe all these things. They measure, for example, how many, time, how many times this axis switching happened, how far you are from the hole, where it, is, where it is the region where really this axis switching happens, how it depends on the geometry of the pipe and all that. But then, OK, where is the mass? And you go to these papers. There is only one formula, mass formula. 
and it is precisely the binormal case. And that's it. So, <laughs> so here I am. No, I don't know really what to do because uh, to prove theorems it doesn't seem to so easy. But in any case, that's what we are trying to do. In particular, I'm kind of optimistic to to try to prove that uh, uh, our version of the Riemann's non-differentiable function can be multifractal, or at least uh, give, given seems that this is going to be. All right. So that's all. Thank you. Yes? Well, you see, it is uh, probably this is one of the reasons why the, the Schrodinger map the Schrodinger map is, is more relevant, is, is better. Uh, it is a very simple one. Eh? Yeah, it is, I guess I made a mess. It's just typically you put here Tn, and then you put Tn cross, uh, then of course in time you have to do something more sophisticated, the room hekuta for order or whatsoever. But uh, the, the thing I wanted to tell you is the following. <coughs> so you are in this, in this step. Okay, so now, and then you are here, you say in J, and you put J here. Then you have to do Tj minus 1, say uh, N. And now you have to put minus 2 times Tj plus N, and this is Tj plus 1. And I guess uh, you have to divide by something, quite likely, so you're sure. So what I wanted to tell you, you see, if, if you were working in the, in the plane, then instead of having this guy, you have little i, right? If, if you are not working in the sphere, I'm sorry, you are working in the plane, instead of having this guy, what you have is little i. And you see, this, for the plane, what you put in here is completely irrelevant. Because this comes, in fact, this is the derivative. Let me put the, the, the derivative. Okay. Okay. This is completely irrelevant. Because it really, this is a, a gauge. And you don't care. You really, you have the freedom of putting here the number you want. The Schrodinger map, see, see, because you don't care, of course, what you put in here. So with this type of a scheme, which means that the only thing you do is to, to write the discrete Laplacian on the right-hand side, and here, well, something a little bit more sophisticated, but that's it. It works. Of course, at each step, we are sure that the, 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 the length of the, the, the tangent vector is some. So every time, we force to be. We force to be in the sphere. Because there is, as far as we know, there is no scheme that precise the property of working on the sphere that works for all time. And I guess that this is a second reason why Working in this guy, uh, working with this expression, uh, stabilizes the process because you force every time to be in the sphere. I don't know if this is enough. <laughs> but okay. <coughs> yes. Uh, a smaller what? The angle or? No, the angular size is, uh, if, the, if the time is t over q, if, the, if it is determined by q, it is never determined by t. Yes, yes, of course. Yes. Uh, you will produce always angles which are bigger. So in a sense, the curvature is becoming smaller. Uh, yeah. When the, when the q becomes very big, yeah. Honestly, I don't know, really. No, no, I am not so sure. No, no. Uh, you will remain, uh, the what it is behind is, that is this uh, Cornu spiral all the time. So you are reproducing all the time these Cornu spirals at different scales. Okay? So uh, I, I really don't understand the point. Okay, but... Uh, what do you mean to be close to circles? You are completely crazy going up and down on different planes. Uh, 
Say that again, Iju. Well, if I start with the square and you give me a regular uh, p over q, then at, at that time I have four times q size. And the angle, of course, becomes uh, uh, bigger and bigger. So in this sense, you could say that you are becoming close to a circle. But the circle lives in a plane, and these guys don't live in a plane binomial. So that's, uh, I guess, that's what I'm trying to tell you, that I don't see how it's going to help you that you are close to a circle when you, are, if you don't see how far you are from the plane, you are missing completely the, the evolution. Theta tends to infinity. Honestly, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, the point is right now is I don't know which is the next. I don't know yet which is the next step. It could be that that is the question, but I don't think right now that that is the next question. I think that the next question is try to see if uh, we can really say something about the multifractality of this uh, nonlinear Riemann to really to understand our nonlinear version of Riemann, and then to pass to the limiting capital M afterwards. But maybe I'm wrong. Okay. I think the problem is uh, from a theoretical point of view, at least for me, is quite challenging. It's really hot. <laughs> ah, uh, I guess it, it could be, but I don't know. Yet. I have a thing. I have a thing. So I was trying to. So okay, so the picture that you showed of the fluid is a really sort of a very flat cone, uh -huh. and they have. And the fluid is flowing, say, in the same dip or at an angle? Uh, no, it is at an angle. So yeah. it is at an angle. That's, uh, that's the reason why I, wrote, I read what it is written there. Yeah. Because it tells you this angle and the angle of attack. Okay. Yeah. And this, and so what you guys are basically observing is that there are vortex filaments that are close to this cone. Mm -hmm. And that at various times, as you look at yourself mm -hmm. further, it's a little bit like opening. So it's like if there's mm -hmm. a vortex filament that approaches that and going away from that match very well what the fluid in this case is uh, desired mm -hmm. pattern. Because I'm actually seeing, I'm actually very interested in the case of the red dot, the, 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 the red vortex. Uh -huh. Is that what I'm talking about? Ah, okay, real cone. The real cone. Okay. And in particular, I'm seeing in that data that there is a trend, a sexual kind of, this kind of, this kind of, You have in there. Like yeah, yeah, so of in course. Particular, you know, you can write down sort of the tonic edges of the case mm -hmm. and try to ask about sort of what's going on on the layer. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm really curious about the, you know, the higher one I'll come to, the faster the layer is because you're really dealing with vortex. Mm -hmm. That's really hard enough. Like, just like, listen, I really want to want vortex. And right now, I'm Uh -huh. Or they look at, you know, smoke in the past. Uh -huh. And what they say is, oh, okay, in particular, you know, if you're filling the in a very circular vortex in the motion of the ridge, it's exactly the same as the vice versa. Okay. Um, but what you observe is that if you take the case of that cone, then, uh, you know, basically you are structuring one of the symmetries of the flow. 
struck mm -hmm. with the murder and it, without without having with actual and not radial critical mm -hmm. um, so if you, you so if you drop tone you refer to it as critical tone angle but the vertical continues up and point down mm -hmm. the vertical automatically rotates and it lands specifically to the mm -hmm. vertex of the head and so uh, we're trying to locate that critical angle numerically at the moment okay um, but of course we, they just say oh this there's a tone and there's some vortexes together in a, in a periodic way, and so I, I, they modeled it by a kind of natural tonic uh, wave equation, mm -hmm. kind of harmonic oscillation, and but with again no no connection to the original order. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't you know what are you, what are you going to do? But if you could, if there was a way to take a surface, an aspect similar in structure to make one for the for the component, then one could. Get an assumption, at least analytical idea of what the, of what the voided piece looks like yeah. on the surface. But I guess the question would be what if it's a surface and you go to the, if you went to the original sort of geodesic type framework, mm -hmm. you would no longer be, uh, it, I mean, it would be similar, but now your, your, your functions would be, o, would be two dimensional instead of parameterized by that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Uh, you know, my impression is that probably one being from this point of view is uh, could play a role, but as I said, like there will be something entirely new, yeah. probably rather something that can work. Because it is the scaling. Right. Uh, because it is the proper scaling to work with delta functions. That's, that is broken entirely. 